first letter that we have. We think there was actually a letter before this that we just don't have anymore. Uh, but the first letter that we have of Paul to the church in Corinth. It's mostly famous for weddings. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. It's been read probably in about a good two-thirds of the weddings that I've been to. Um, it's, uh, but even um, there are 12 chapters before that and three afterwards too, so we're going to reckon with all of them. And some of them aren't terribly polite, so let's, uh, let's pray as we come into this, uh, this book. Gracious God, we thank you for your wisdom. Uh, we thank you for showing us the right way to go. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for in your, the fact that in your wisdom, we learn more about us. We learn about the way we should follow you. And we learn more and more about your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we open these words today, uh, may you help us to understand them. May you teach us more of who you are. And may we come closer and closer uh, in love with you and in serving your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, I thought the first thing we should do is probably meet the Corinthians. And uh, before we set the scene for Corinth in those times, let's have a look at where it was. Now, it was in the Roman Empire at the time. You can see Corinth kind of in the middle uh, in the sort of the, about a third of the way up the screen. Uh, it's uh, just on the edge there of this little isthmus. It was a pretty important place. It's, um, it was, as I say, part of, it was kind of the New York of the, uh, the Roman Empire. It was pretty hip, cool, very metropolis, uh, very metropolitan, I should say, um, and very um, also quite multiracial as well. So, it was also a key trade route, which you can see those three dots there across there, called the Isthmus of uh, Corinth. Believe it or not, rather than go around south uh, of uh, that particular point of Greece, uh, people, um, which were known as being dangerous seas, people would actually put the load that was on their ships onto a cart and then they will be wheeled by human beings across that isthmus. So, it was a real, so there was a lot of trade that happened there, and it was a, a place where a lot of people passed through. And therefore, it became quite wealthy. It was a key trade route. And there was plenty of money there. So, there we go. There was plenty of money in the city. Uh, lots of people there who had um, been part of the trade uh, trade economy, there was, um, it was quite, as I said before, quite pluralistic and multiracial. There were certainly a lot of people who were from Corinth itself, but also uh, many who come from other places. And it was um, partly because that was, I'll come back to that in a moment, it was a very young city. It was actually overthrown in just 146 BC and uh, rebuilt in 44 BC, only about 100 years later, by Julius Caesar. And yet, this only, maybe 70 years later, 80 years later, it is one of the three strongest cities with Rome and Alexandria in all of the Roman Empire. It was a land of opportunity, you might remember, may have heard that the Roman soldiers, when they retired, if they survived that long, they retired, they were able to retire as a Roman citizen. However, in Rome, there was a certain snobbery about such people, and uh, they, whilst they were Roman citizens, they weren't really supposed, they, nobody really wanted them in Rome. And so Corinth was set up as an alternative. And so you had all of these retired soldiers there, from all sorts of nations, so, as well as a bunch of freedmen as well. So you had also a lot of, uh, had, they also had a lot of people working for them. So you had people who were a little more than slaves, really, right through to budding entrepreneurs, or well-established businessmen. 
And therefore, they weren't ranked on how powerful they were or anything like that. It was re they were really ranked on their commercial success, their strength, commercially and physical, and being the loudest voice. But with that, with people wanting to become more, more and more successful, they also became more corrupt. They had a lot of gods, a lot of different people bring their own thoughts about who God was, and, of course, corruption, which came with it. So their moral level was very, very low. People went there because they wanted to make their fortune. They were self-made and they were motivated. They, were, they wanted to get things done and build themselves up, build their, their own little empire. Well, Paul comes into this city and he finds that there is actually a strong Jewish community. But pretty quickly, he gets tossed out of the synagogue itself. Seems to be a bit of a pattern for Paul. However, he does gain really strong traction with the God-fearers. The God-fearers were people who weren't necessarily Jews, but they did believe in the Jewish God, our God. And so they were, they were sort, of, sort of attracted to the Jewish faith with its focus on just the one God and also the, the, uh, the godly living, just without the painful bits. So, and after 18 months, when Paul leaves, there's a really strong church that's been left behind. It's one of the th in this very strong city. Some of the upside, upshots of that, some of the really good points were, of this church were they have been very active in their faith. They have taken it on and they want to grow more and more in their faith. They keep on sharing it with others. They've been exploring the gifts that God has given them. They want to grow in that. They want to know more of God and more of what God has to offer. And it's a very dynamic church. It's, uh, it's not a very institutionalized church. It's actually far more organic than that. Responding to the opportunities that God has given her in various ways. But they also face quite a few challenges as a church, which we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. This week, we see one challenge that is indicative of the motivation for many of the other challenges, the challenge of divisions in the church. So let's just reread some of those verses that uh, Janice read for us a moment ago, uh, verses 10 to 12. It says... You can see that on the screen. Let me read it to you as well. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Kephas, as the Apostle Peter, and still another, I follow Christ. The people of the church are starting create, to create factions within itself based around the different teachers, the different authorities that they had, the different biases or different uh, themes in their preaching. Not schisms where groups are breaking away. They're still within the church. But those factions are certainly making the church far less healthy than it should be. But where are those factions coming from? What does Paul say that the problems are? Is it theology or missiology or chronology or is it about... No, none of those. It's actually about which teacher they follow. And that makes sense if there were major differences between the teachers. Perhaps one emphasised one point or was a little more accomplished than the other. But they're not, apart from Jesus. As far as we can tell, these leaders were pretty much all on the same message. The gospel of salvation. But as we look at the particulars of Paul's statement in those three verses, we see the root of the problem. I follow... Oops, sorry, go back. Lost my page. 
Oh, it's still there. There we go. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Kephas. I follow Jesus Christ. I, 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 I. It is the person themselves on whom the emphasis is placed. The reputation is based on the things they do and the person they follow. It places the emphasis on the choice the person has made on whom they follow. And Paul answers this from the beginning of the letter all the way back in verse 1. He starts off by saying, introducing himself, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. No I. Called to be an apostle of Christ by the will of God. Paul is the one of whose is one of those whom people have decided to associate with. But he shows how ridiculous this is, even, in has, even as he announces himself. The apostle, um, come, um, sorry, apostle comes from the Greek word apostello, which literally means I send. So Paul is describing himself as someone who is called to be sent. By whom? God. Why? To take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Paul has been called and sent by God to deliver the good news about Jesus. The important person here is not Paul. It is the person who sent him and the message that he takes. It simply makes no sense to worship Paul when he simply is the message carrier. It'd be like getting a wonderful gift in the post from a dear friend. Then the next day, waiting at the front of your house at the mailbox with a great big bunch of flowers for the postman and asking him how you should use this gift that your friend has sent you. You just wouldn't do it, would you? You would ring up your friend and thank them and then receive instructions on how you need to best use it. In the same way, Paul wants, us, wants these people to understand that it really doesn't matter who taught them or who was instrumental in bringing them to Christ. He almost sounds offhand with those he baptised. Not because he doesn't care about who he's baptised. Thanksgiving before shows how much he rejoices in their salvation. But he wants them to realise that to place any importance on the messenger is to miss the whole point. Apollos, Peter, Paul, none of them hold any importance next to the, the message they bring. And as you read this first chapter, it almost seems like he has a literary stutter. He doesn't seem to be able to get through more than five or six words without writing God or Christ Jesus or Lord Jesus Christ. The reason that Paul was, had, was giving thanks for them was because of what Christ had done for them and in them and what he will keep doing because of God's faithfulness, not because of what somebody else has done. The choice of who they follow doesn't matter at all. They can't make themselves look any better in comparison to each other by what they do or who they choose because the only choice that matters is that God chose them in Christ. In the weeks to come, we'll see time and time again how this desire to be better or more important than the next, next person in the church will, make, uh, will cause other issues to arise as well. The church members ask questions to prove themselves right, better, more spiritual. But in doing that, they continually ask the wrong question. All it can do is cause division within, uh, uh, which is, sorry, all it can do is cause division rather than what is Christ's heart for his church, unity. His purpose for the church is to be unified in him and him alone. But it does raise a couple of questions for us as we, uh, as we wind up this morning. The first one is this. What about denominations? If we're all supposed to be unified together, why do we have all these different denominations? I used to be part of, um, used to go and 
meet every now and again with the, uh, uh, the leaders of the Christian churches in, uh, in South Australia. It was the group of the bishops, uh, so all the archbishops and the, the CEOs of their denomination. And uh, don't, I wasn't that important. I just went there to give a report. Uh, but it was a... Um, but you looked around the room and there were 14 different den- denominations all sitting there as you came in there. Have they all got it all wrong? Is, is to actually have denominations a terrible thing to do? If there is only one Jesus and one gospel, why do we have so many denominations? What is the point? Are we breaking Christ's purpose for the church by having them? Funnily enough, the Bible doesn't say much about denominations. They weren't a thing back then. But it does talk about unity. And the reality is that denominations today have arisen out of God's history of challenging the church at different times and in different ways and through different people. Many of today's denominations were not set up so much as to break away from the established church rather than to reform the church from within. Our own, for this, those who have in the past gathered in this building, the Methodists, that tradition was initially simply a movement to reform the Church of England, to bring it back to the point where Christ was accessible to the masses again. The breakaway from a new, into a new denomination only came out of necessity because of the way the Methodists were treated by the Church of England at the time. Now we're good friends. Some of those priorities have become hallmarks of today's denominations. But they now will often see each other as different parts of the same church, working together where possible and all carrying out their part in God's mission. However, there is one priority where divisions are critical, and that is clear from those early verses of chapter 1. And that is the absolute centrality of the gospel of Christ, enabling the whole church to grow together under God's hand and his gifting. That's the calling of every church community as part of the wider church of God. If a church is not doing that, it's effectively saying that it no longer wants to belong to Christ. So let's keep Christ at the centre of our church and look to God to take us where he would have us go. And finally, what does this mean for us? Paul's words make us reflect on the way we see ourselves and one another. Think for a moment. Where do you see yourself in the church community? Do you see yourself as a more important or powerful person in the church? Or someone who simply doesn't have a voice? What do you base that on? The number of years you've been at part of this congregation? Your years as a Christian? how heavy your Bible is. The number of positions you hold here or in other parts of the wider church in Adelaide or abroad. Whether you can quote the Lord's Prayer off by heart and which version. The positions you held in secular circles or the amount that you do to serve the church. Friends, if that is how we are measuring our importance in our church... If that is how we determine what we do, who we listen to, we are going to find ourselves in the same state of affairs affairs as the church in Corinth. And we will see in coming weeks, as as good as it looked from the outside, that church was in an extraordinarily dilapidated state. And that is what happens when we place our worth in anything else but God's love of us that caused him to send his only son so that we might know him and his love for us, which gives us our eternal life and eternal worth as his beloved child. Therefore, our first motivation in our interactions with each other, what we say, what we do, are only here because Jesus died and rose for us. We are important and high-ranking based on just one thing, 
and one thing alone. God loved us first. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we come here today, we thank you that we are part of your church across the world, across time. Lord, we thank you that you have continued to raise up people who will lead us forward, who will, con- who will find ways of serving us and indeed helping others to find you, to find Jesus. Lord, thank you for our leaders, the way that they do serve you in the, in the many ways that they do. Lord, may we never place our worth in anything more than you. May we realise that our very life is only ours because you gave it to us. And we thank you that we get to share in our life with you. So Lord, as we continue our time through this book, may we keep our eyes firmly set on you. May you be our origin, may you be our way, and may you be our goal in everything that we do. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.